basically. What is the connection between the world and Hashem? Is it an everlasting connection or perhaps Hashem created something and is letting it float in the universe? So um, that was chapter three and actually also chapter two. Chapter three, we spoke about a very, very um, important parable that Al Rebbe brings. And Al Rebbe tells us that um, if we take a look at the sun, or if we think about the sun's rays, is that correct? The rays of the sun, we look around us and it seems like they have um, they have uh, self-existence here in the world, right? Because we can benefit, we could enjoy the rains of the sun. And the sun uh, not only gives us light, it gives us also life and energy, uh, life to the trees, to the plants around us. There are certain plants that live only because of the light of the sun. If there was no sun, they wouldn't have life. Um, and definitely we could say that the rains of the sun exist also within the sun itself. If they are here in the world, they have to come from some source, right? What is the source? The sun itself. Perfect. So they definitely exist over there in the sun itself. How do they exist over there in the sun itself? Is it in the same shape that they exist over here in the world here? No. no, that's impossible because it's much more intense. It's much more strong, powerful. That's why we cannot investigate the, the sun properly because we cannot come close to the sun. But we know that it exists over there and that is the idea of nullification. The rays do exist, but they are nullified by the existence of the sun itself, which is much more powerful, which is, so to speak, much different than the rays of the sun. On a much higher level, it's a different scale of light, it's a different scale of heat. Probably you can't even really describe it in Celsius or Fahrenheit. That's a, a, a false way of describing the heat of the sun at the sun itself, or the rays of the sun within the sun itself. Defining what it means, what are the rays of the sun within the sun itself? They are nullified, they are light. It's not the sun, it's the light, because we know that the light extends and when it travels a certain amount of time. So here, this is what we see in front of us, because that's what happens there. The light of the sun travels, travels at the speed of light from the sun itself all the way to, to, to planet Earth. And that is uh, to show us that the rains they are they are something else but when they are in the sun they are nullified we don't refer to them as many times there's a parable another parable that is brought is when um, there's a king and there's the king's ministers so if you meet in the street a minister or a, a member of the knesset or an advisor of the king, whoever it might be, and being here, you might come across uh, one or two of them. Um, even when it's not election time. When it's election time, you see them all over. You see them doing shopping. <laughs> um, and what's interesting is that the moment, uh, you, so when you see them, in their office, wherever it is. So you give them their respect, their honor, their word is something special. But the moment you enter the king's palace, and next to the king you can see this minister, this minister, this minister, you're not going to pay any attention to them. Your focus is on the king himself. Your focus is, and all the attention, all the eyes are on the king. Nothing else matters anymore. Why? Because the presence of the king is much more powerful. It swallows up the rest of the uh, uh, individuals that are there in the room. People won't even notice. 
it's like they did i don't know what the exact word or the experiment um <clears throat> the blind ball or something like that i don't remember exactly so the point was is that you had to count how many red balls are bouncing in the room and um while you're counting them so <laughs> on the screen they bring through a, a human what just walks through and they ask people did you notice the human in the room and everyone says no or 90 percent of the people say no why because they're so concentrated in counting these balls that are bouncing in the room to see how many balls that they don't notice the human at all that's like selective vision maybe we could call it so when the king is there the focus is on the king we're not going to notice say oh this person was here but they don't even notice they're focused on on something totally totally different yes so if we say that the rays of the sun are the product of the sun but when they're inside the sun yeah the product is being nullified right right when they are outside of the sun there also is a level of a nullification but it's a lower level of nullification which means when you see the sun when you see the light you know that the sun's up so that also is a level of nullification because you recognize that the sun uh, is here because the light of the sun the rays of the sun are here because of the sun itself So that is also a certain level of nullification, but it does not come close to the level of nullification when we describe the rays of the sun within the sun itself. When it's within the sun itself, it becomes a different metziot. It's not, it's not rays of the sun anymore. It's part of the sun in a certain way. Correct. Right. We definitely know that the idea is there, and this is what's hard to define exactly, and we have to try and contemplate to understand what's going on, how to balance it too. But we know that the rays come here, so they definitely exist there, but it's a different type of existence. Now, this is all a parable. What is this parable uh, here to tell us? The parable is here to tell us that the universe that was created, worth whatever was created together with it, Humans, animals, trees, seas, whatever it might be, fish, are exactly the same as the rays of the sun within the sun itself. Because we know that ain od milvado, there's nothing else besides Hashem. And not only that, melo kol haaretz kvado. Hashem fills the entire existence with His honor, with His with His presence. So it's not like the rays of the sun outside of the sun. <clears throat> it's the rays of the sun within the sun. We are here within the Metsius of Hashem. And the Altar Rebbe concludes with the question, if so, how do we walk freely fe feeling that we are human beings with a self-existence? It's like describing the rays of the sun that's within the sun and saying that it's the same rays as we see over here. No, it's not. It's impossible. It's much hotter over there. So we are like in the sun itself, because Hashem exists around here in this world. But nevertheless, we are not feeling the sun. How is that possible? And that is the question. I'm opening brackets. And there, there are, we learn Hasidus. There are very, quite a few parts to the Torah. Pshat learning the simple, basic explanation to the Torah, remes, which are hints, drush, which are drashot, uh, sermons, which are like, um, shat remes, drush, soy, the secrets of the Torah, which is chasidus, kabbalah. There, there is also a part that is known as sifre musar. The musar books, like, for example, chovat alevavot, shara bitachon, within chovat alevavot, Chovat Alevavot itself is a very, very powerful book. That is Sifre Musa to guide a person uh, to have the right uh, midot to purify his traits, etc. And there is what's known as Sifre Chakira. Sifre Chakira, Chakira comes from the word investigation. 
And what are, what are those books um, uh, discuss? They discuss investigating the existence of Hashem. There are a few. The famous one is Moira Nevuchim. Moira Nevuchim is a guide to the complex, if I'm not mistaken. Perfect. 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 Thank, thank you. Close. Um, and there are a few others that are the Kuzari, which is a whole fascinating story for itself. How a kingdom in the southern part of Russia, you could call it, maybe perhaps where Azerbaijan is today, Kazakhstan is today, that area, they all converted into Judaism. And they had, the king there had a whole discussion, letters back and forth with Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, who is known as the Kuzari, who lived in Spain at that time. And that was the golden era of Judaism in Spain. Torah Zahav, a lot of the streets here are named after rabbis and leaders that lived in that time, such as Shmuel Hanagid. Rabbi Shmuel Hanagid. This is a street not far from here. Which are the... Um, there is Gan HaKuzari, not far from here. Is Gan HaKuzari that leads between El Kharizi and Karen Kayemet. Right here, across the gymnasium, perfect. So in Rechavia, we get to live the history. Yeah. I, bet we could, I would give people that uh, um, at the end of King Jabul's reign, he yeah. went home to Kavach Shabul. Let's wait down the street for me. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Yep, then. Yeah, that's what's so special about living in Israel. Well, that's the Kavach Shabul. First of all, there's a good chance that it is. But if not, it's still, it's, uh, yeah. Um, everything, yeah, everything happened right here. Yeah. So we don't really learn Sifre Kabbalah books of investigation. We don't want to question Hashem's existence through learning Sifre Kabbalah. And why? It's because we have a problem. Again, if someone wants to learn it, you are entitled to learn it, of course. It's part of the Torah. It's not just like philosophy, external philosophy, but it's all about the approach. And the reason that they said it's better not to learn it if you don't need to is because you might read it late at night and you will fall asleep after reading the question and you won't come to the answer yet. And that is a problem. Because if you go to sleep about questioning Hashem's existence, it's not good for you on Hashem. Right? It's like couples, they say, never go to sleep um, um, in the middle of a fight or an argument. Solve the argument and then you go to sleep. Why? Because when you go to sleep with the argument, with the, then uh, it's not good. It's like you... It's like you 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 you, ground, you you have a certain territory that you that's it. So when we go to sleep with a question about the Metsias of Hashem, that's not good. So we ended chapter three with a question. The Alter Rebbe ends up with a question. Alter Rebbe says, "How could it be that we that we know, of course, that Hashem exists over there? So therefore, the question is, why do we feel like we have our self existence?" So we finished chapter three, close the book, and we are now, we are past a week with no answer to that question. Is that something good or not? Well, in this case, we can't speak for everyone. Yeah. Where we didn't think of the golden book. Yeah. So it's probably the best. That's yeah. Oh, because, yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, so uh, the answer that the Hasidim used to say, and it's very interesting, is if we take a look at the question, what is the question? The question is not about the existence of Hashem. We are not questioning Hashem's existence. Sifre Kabbalah investigations, they are there and they question, does Hashem exist? What level? Does He feel us? Does He connect to us? Did He command us? Does He take interest? It's all about questioning Him here. Yeah. If we take a look at what the Al-Turabi says, the Al-Turabi does not question Hashem. The Al-Turabi questions us. 
He questions our existence. He says, Hashem exists. That's a fact. No one's questioning that. Not only that, but it's like as if the sun itself is here in the world. The core of Hashem's existence is here in the world. And his question is, the question mark is, so how do we walk around without feeling it? That's okay. To question yourself, your self-existence, that is something that is okay. That is something that you can um, go along with, can loop. Do you understand that the actual, you ever had an actual moment? I think I do, but I'm not responsible. Questioning your existence no, is actually happening? Well, not theoretically, actually. Because of a specific thing that was happening, or? No, I think it was a normal. Just a regular Sunday. Yeah. Some people, you know, you they I don't know, they, they win the lottery. They they got to pinch themselves that that's about something that's happening. Is this really happening? There's Hashem only in uh, in positive things, in good things. But um, yes, it's, it definitely shows something when you question whether uh, whether the ex it comes from feeling Hashem's life, probably. That's why we question ourselves about it. So this is what Dr. Rebbe said. Hashem's existence, and in Alter Rebbe's word, I'm going to read it over here. And that's what Sanof pointed out also at the last, the end of the last year, that the parable is not very uh similar not 100 percent accurate um to what we're speaking about the existence of hashem speaking about the parable we don't feel the sun here the actual sun here in the world and the question is, Velama, therefore, why aren't they nullified um, uh, completely with, uh, to their source? And that's the question. Okay, let's start reading. We're going to read um, chapter 4. Chapter 4, and I want to ask Mordechai to read for us right at the beginning. It is written for a sun and a shield is Hava A Elohim. The explanation of this verse is as follows. Shield is a covering for the sun to protect the creatures so that they should be able to bear its heat. As our sages of blessed memory have said, in time to come, the holy one, but speaking, will take out the sun from its sheet. The wicked will be punished by it. Now, just as the covering shield to and I mean, conceals the sun, so does the name Elohim shield or conceal the name Havai must be he. So we all know that when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the sun, there is perhaps maybe even a few layers, but definitely there's what we know the the Uzon. How do they say it in English? Uzon, right? Which is what? What's the uzon? The idea of the uzon is like a it's a layer that protects uh, something, it either rays or heat or whatever from the from the sun. Sorry. Correct. Uh -huh. So that is the uzon, and we know that without the uzon, uh, ozone. ozone. Okay. So uh, without that layer, so we know that the sun probably would have a, a stronger effect on the world over here. And every time that there's a pollution, they say that it's uh, disturbing the ozone and that it's uh, causing uh, a climate change and that icebergs are melting in, in Antarctica. So, um, so that protects us from the sun. In that same way, Hashem also, He has the sun which is basically the source 
and the core of his existence. And over that, there has to be a protection. And here we will call this Simtsu. Perhaps we could call it also um, concealment. That Hashem is, uh, is covered in a certain way in order to protect who we're we trying to protect over here. Us, the world, to protect us from becoming totally nullified within the existence of Hashem. And that is something that's, uh, that's very important. That's the names of Hashem, for example. This is what the Alter Rebbe starts off with. We know that there are two names, two famous names, Hashem and Elohim. So, or in the words of the Alter Rebbe here that Mordechai read for us, so it's Havaye and Elohim. What is, what is the difference? Why does Hashem need two names? And what is the difference between the two? So Havaya refers to Hashem's existence on a higher level, like the core of the sun, like the, what's the word, how would we describe it? The, the, the essence of the sun, the, um, the actual sun. And then there's the rays of the sun. So in, the, in that same way, the name Havaya, Yudke Vavke, that is the, so to speak, the essence of Hashem. And then there's the rays of Hashem, the light of Hashem, which is the name Elohim. And the name Elohim also provides a protection from the enormous light of the name Havai. Let's read on and we'll see the difference between the two. Chanof, <clears throat> second paragraph. So the meaning of the name Havai is that which brings everything into existence ex nihilo. The prefix added to the stem. When you say that, yeah, yeah. Ha ha modifies the verb, indicating that the action is present and continuous. As Rashi comments on the verse, in this manner, it was Joe to. No, no, no. Um, so it was Yeah. All the days, namely the light force which flows at every instant into all things created from that which proceeds out of the mouth of God and is bread and brings them into existence at Snevo at every moment. For the fact that they were created during the six days of creation is not sufficient for their continued existence as explained above. Now I started reading the uh, Rabbi uh, Seisel's book, The yeah. Pedal World. Is, right. And he says that existence is created ex nihilo. Right. But the renewal is not ex nihilo, it's revelation. Um, it's an interesting way to, that he defines it. I, I've got to understand a bit more what does it mean. Because uh, because the idea of the Alter Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe is very clear about what he says. And here, this is yeah. what he says now, that it's a continuous okay. process of recreating in a way of ex nihilo. And, and the idea is that there's a reason to it. It's not just that Hashem wants to. The default of the existence is not to exist. So you always have this, like throwing a stone in the air, right? Throwing a stone in the air or kicking a ball, you've got to always kick it. Otherwise, it's not going to go by itself. Or there's got to be a different force. It could be wind, it could be... But there's something because the default of still objects are to stay still. So the default of our existence is not to exist. And why? It's because our existence is not God himself. The only thing that exists by itself is Hashem. So this is the idea of Kacha Yaseyo. That's the Yud Kevav Ke. Why do we need the Yud? Hove means existing. Havaya, it's like the Havaya, what's happening. Yud means that there is, like Milashon Yas said, that it is a, it's a continuous uh, process that is constantly happen, 
happening. Like with Eov that we spoke about. Kacha Yaase Eov, that was that that is what Eov will do. Will do does not mean only in the future, but will do means from now onwards until the rest of his life. Lifetime. This is what I will do. Okay, I will breathe until for the rest of my life. Certain things that Hashem will create the world every single moment. That's the idea of Yud Ke Vav Ke. Yud and Hove. Yud is that Hashem will constantly recreate the world. So it has to be from Ex Nilo. But I was thinking that Ex Nilo is a one time creation and Revelation is larger different parts of creation. Um, so that's going already into trying and in, to understand a bit more what he speaks over there. I've got to look inside. And I've got to understand what do you mean when you say revelation? I'll copy the pages. Thank you. Thank you. What does it mean, revelation? Of course, it's a revelation of Hashem. I'll take there is a very interesting difference, and we'll get to it soon. There is one difference. We would see that revelation is discovering new parts that we didn't know before. Yeah. But it's a one time ex nihilo. Yes. Yeah. So, again, it depends what revelation means. I'll give you a, a, a difference between, and it's very much connected to Rosh Hashanah, uh, the difference between the initial creation and the creation that, ha that happens now. So, the initial creation was, as, as it says in Chasidut, Ki Hashem is kind. And we're going to see it here also in the words of the Al-Tarene. That, that one of the attributes of Hashem is chesed, kindness. So Hashem is kind, and as a result, He wants to create the world. Because when He will create the world, He'll have, first of all, that itself is an act of kindness. And He'll have many more opportunities to act in ways of kindness. But was there a reason that He created it? Like, did we cause any, did we have any impact on Hashem creating it? No. We did not exist. And it's like, you go to the bank. So at the beginning, the bank is prepared to give you a loan. Later on, the bank says, well, you've got to start returning the loan. And based on your return, I will add more to your loan. Okay, so with Hashem, the initial creation was, He gave it as a free check, an open check. Afterwards, he started to demand and require our work. And this is what we do in Rosh Hashanah. What do we do in Rosh Hashanah? We convince Hashem to extend the loan for initial year, for another year. And why is that? It's because it's all dependent on our hands. We have to do the Avodah. Avodat Nivrain. So maybe that is a, a, a different way to interpret the idea of revelation and ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means Hashem doesn't... Now it's a, ma a matter of revelation. Again, it's in the same way of ex nihilo, but it is based on our deeds, on our behavior, on our actions. So maybe it's more of an idea of revelation. We'll see it here, but in the words of Alter Rebbe, and perhaps it's a way to interpret it, but I don't want to go deep into that idea because I don't know what the idea of revelation is, is coming, to, what is he coming to say by that? Because again, the process, the technicalities, is that constantly the world goes from now to an existence. And without that, there's no other way to create it. It's like you would say there's a certain way to cause a ball to fly in the air. There's no other way to do it besides giving it a push in one way or another. You're going to push the tiniest atom ever. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Smallest thing. Uh, there is no, and we understand it very well in our in our minds that there's no such a thing as something that exists by itself. There's always a source to that idea, and I think that the fact that we can understand it and comprehend it in our minds is part of what Hashem gave us to. That is the little hint that He is here, because otherwise you don't feel that He's here. The only time you feel that He's here is when you question yourself, "Oh, wait a second, where do I come from?" Or like the question that they say that everyone has, am I, um, how do you say, 
am I um, adopted? <laughs> People, they say, they like to ask these questions to themselves. Am I adopted? Which is, it's like, where do I come from? Like, people are looking for a source, for a reliable source. So in that same way, and this is something that always will be like it says, Kahaya Seyo. Let's continue to the, to the third paragraph. In the enumeration of the praises of the Holy One, Blessed Be He, it is written in Haggadol, uh, the Great, and Haggimor, the Mighty, etc. Hagadol refers to the attribute of chesed, kindness, and the spreading forth of the life force into all worlds and created things without end or limit, so that they shall be created ex nihilo and exist through chesed chinam. Yes, this is chesed chinam, chinam which, which is gratuitous kindness, or chinam being free. Yeah, fair, free, not fun. So yeah. this is referring again to the initial creation of the world when Hashem created the world um, the first time. So this was gracious kindness with no nothing in return. We didn't have any impact. Right. And the ad, and the attribute of Tesla is called uh Gedula. Gedula, greatness, for it's not for the greatness of the Holy One blessed be he in his glory and essence. For God is great, and His greatness is unsearchable. And therefore, He also causes life force and existence ex nihilo to issue forth for an unlimited number of worlds and creatures. Okay. For it is the nature of the benef uh, beneficent to do good. Ah, oh, that's it. This is His nature, and that's why He created it. This is what we say that Hashem is great. Or when you say that someone is great, you're referring to the fact that he is open to the idea of sharing and of being kind to others, spreading his light. And this is one of the attributes of Hashem. The initial idea of creating the world, why would you create the world in the first place? And here we get to the difference between Chesed and Gevura. Gevura is not bad. We discuss this often. There's nothing bad about Gevura. Sometimes they interpret it as harshness, yes. But harshness itself is not bad. Harshness means that if there's a reason, I will do so. No reason, I won't do so. Gevura, another word for Gevura is din, judgment. When you go to the judge, initially the judge tells you, I want you to try settle this without me getting involved. Because the moment the judge gets involved, he does it according to the din, which means he has got to get all the details in place. He's got to know what happened. And based on that, he'll say, you know what? Even if there was a misunderstanding or there was a miss this, a miss that, that is the deal. You've got to stick to it. And that is Gevura. So in other words, coming from the point of Gevura, harshness, din, judgment, Hashem would not create the world. Why wouldn't he create the world? Because why yes? Gevura is not here to show greatness. It's not here to show how kind he is. You've got to convince Gevura to act. And when Gevura acts, it's according to the amount and to the limit that he needs to. That there's a reason for. And if there's no reason, so he's not going to act. And by the way, these are qualities and traits within our personalities as well. Some people are very kind. They have no limits. And that's the idea of chesed. Chesed has no boundaries, no limits. That could also be a downside to the idea of greatness of chesed. And that's what led to the door Hamabul, the generation of the flood. Because Hashem was great, He granted life to everyone. They lived for many, many years then. And they had a world of, of Shefa, plenty. But there was no responsibility. And that's why there was no Gevura. So Hashem said, you know what, I have to get Gevura involved as well. It started actually before the Mabul. Um, because Hashem said, the world's not going to sustain itself in this way, where people are not um, responsible over their deeds. And that comes from Kavura, harshness. You've got to be responsible. You've got to take uh, responsibility over what you do. So Chesed is the first initial trait that Hashem uses to create the world, which is, okay, I want to give you guys a chance. 
I see a huge potential. I want to show my greatness. I want to be kind. I create the world. Then what happens? Let's see. Vagya, this is already up to you. Yeah. I, I've heard it said in the Swiss Factory also that Hashem's preference, I don't know if you want to call it a need, is, is that creation should recognize them. Yes. To recognize his glory. There are a few reasons. So one is that we said Hashem wants to be kind. That is about him, not about us. So he doesn't really want us, according to that, to be recognized. He wants to be kind to others. Sometimes people um, also have this, this, uh, uh, this trait, right? They want to be kind to others. They don't really think about the way the other person receives it. Or sometimes they are kind to, to animals. There's nothing wrong, of course. Uh, but when a person is kind to animals, often it's to answer a need that he has within him. And it's not about the animals. Which, and that simply means that he wants, to, he wants to be kind. He wants to be a person to, that, that can give to others. The second reason is that Hashem wants to be recognized. He wants to be known. He wants to be accepted. That's why he created us. Glory. His glory, right? And that already involves a bit of Gevura. Because it's about the other person's perspective as well. If we're not going to recognize him, Hashem's going to say, well, what's the point of all of this? So there is a limit already. Once there's a limit, that involves Gevura. Hasidus does bring these two answers. There's nothing wrong to these answers, but Chassidus adds an, another answer, and we discuss this chapters 36 and 37 in the first part of Tanya, and that, and that is that Hashem wants us to make a, to create out of this world, this material, physical world, to create a home for Hashem here. And that is the ultimate answer. That will explain to us what is the idea of Torah, what's the idea of mitzvahs, what is the value of a mitzvah, what is the purpose and what do we see around us? So that's like, I would say, again, all answers are right. There are several levels within the decision of Hashem creating the world. And each reason is right for that level, for that idea that it's here to bring out. So yes, Hashem is kind. That's why there's no bad that comes down to the world. And as we said, we asked we ask for a Shana Tova Umetuka. We want a, a good and a sweet year. Why do we want it to be sweet? Because goodness is, is everything. Everything is good. Even something that tastes bitter or tastes sour. But we want it to be also sweet. So that's an additional thing. Let's continue with the fourth paragraph. Mm -hmm. Now, this attribute of Hesed is the praise of the Holy One. Blessed be He alone, for no created thing can create a being out of naught and give it life. This attribute is also beyond the cognition of all creatures and their understanding. For it is not within the power of the intellect of any creature to understand and comprehend this quality and its ability to create a being out of nothing and vivify it. For creatio ex nihilo is a matter which transcends the intellect of the creatures in as much as it stems from the divine attribute of the Dula. In the Holy One, blessed be He and His attributes are a perfect unity. As the Holy Zohar states, He and His attributes are one, and just as it is not possible for any creature's mind to comprehend His Creator, so it is impossible for Him to comprehend His attributes. Yes, then. So we cannot really understand the full capacity of this attribute of gedula, of greatness. The idea that someone would go and create an entire world just to be kind. That is um, the idea that limits don't really exist. The light of Hashem. And in a certain way, it's similar to the light of the sun. The light of the sun has no limits. It shines. It shines completely. There's nothing that's stopping it. Soon we'll see there's just something external that is stopping it. But otherwise, the, the, the sun is there to shine. So Hashem is much more than that. There is a side to Him. And by the way, this is where the Ein Sof, the unlimited light, enters. Because the unlimited light 
is here to explain to us that there's no limits for Hashem. Hashem shines forever in a, in a much higher and deeper way. So this is the idea when we speak about Gedula greatness, that is one side of Hashem, one side of the coin, where Hashem shows that He is kind and that there are no limits, no boundaries, and he, and that is or and Sof, the unlimited light of Hashem. The sun is limited because it's after all a certain size, but Hashem is unlimited. There's no size. Size doesn't count over there. So therefore, His light becomes unlimited, exactly like He is unlimited. That's one side of the coin. Now let's see the other side of the coin. And again, we can't really comprehend this idea. As humans, everything has a beginning and has an end. And there's no such a, and that's no such a thing as a person just that has no boundaries at all. It doesn't work that way. So let's take a look at the other side of Hashem because the other side of Hashem is even more interesting. And so I want to ask Mordechai to please read for us. This is the last paragraph here on the page. <clears throat> and just as it is impossible for any creature's mind to apprehend his attribute of Gedula, which is the ability to create a being out of nothing and give it life, as it is written, the world is built by kindness, and exactly so, it is not possible for him to apprehend the divine attribute of Gavura, might and restraint, which is the quality of him. Sitsu, condensation, contraction, and concentration. Ah, oh, so here we are introduced to the word Tzimtzum, very famous word, three ways to explain it, concentration, contraction, condensation. Okay, let's continue. And restraint of the spreading forth of the life force, from his attribute of Gandula, preventing it from the descending upon and manifesting itself to the creatures to give them life and existence in the field of matter, but rather with his continence concealed. For the life force conceals itself in the body of the created being, and it appears as though the body of the created being has independent existence and is not merely the spreading point of the life force and spirituality. As the diffusion of the radiation and light from the sun, but an independently existing entity. Wow. Although <clears throat> in reality it has no independent existence and is only like the diffusion of the light from the sun. Nonetheless, this concealment is the very restraining power of the Holy One, must be he who is of the omnipotent to condense the life force and spirituality which issues from the breath of his mouth and conceal it so that the body of the created being shall not become nullified. Yeah, Femme Wow, so that's, that, that gives us some kind of answer to our question. And here the Alter Rebbe introduces us to the other side of the coin, to the other side of Hashem. And what is that? That is the Gevura. Hashem has Gedula and He has Gevura. Gevura, like we spoke, is Midas Hatin. That is the idea of Tzimtzum, where Hashem contracts Himself from certain space, from certain area, and brings limit to His light Himself. So is that a sign, a sign of weakness or a sign of strength? The fact that Hashem con contracts himself on a certain area, excuse me, uh, conceals himself in a certain way, is that, is that something good or something bad? It's good. And why is that? Because it shows a higher power within Hashem. That he can also hide himself. That he can also put certain limits. Otherwise, he's just unlimited. That is just a one-way road. Here we say that there's a way back as well. And that is very important because that exactly is what gives us the feeling that we have our self-existence. So yes, Hashem exists over here, but He was able to contract Himself, to conceal Himself, to hide Himself in a certain way that we don't feel it. And that is real greatness. If you're out there wanting to do chesed, 
wanting to be kind to others, sometimes you might end up being cruel. And like they say, if you have mercy on people that are cruel, you will end up being cruel to good people as well. Because that shows that there are no boundaries, no limits. And there are very powerful stories about that. There was once, um, um, it, it has very much to do with what's happening now. You want to be kind, you want to say, okay, no wars, no, no uh, killing, but you, you will end up, first of all, being cruel to innocent people, like what happened on the 7th of October on Simchat Torah itself. So we were very kind. We didn't uh, fight them properly before and get rid of them before. So what happened is we got uh, innocent people suffered a lot. And not only our innocent people, but other, other innocent people as well. So those innocent people also are suffering because we have this false mercy. And we don't want to deal with the problem like we should deal with it. It's cruel to be kind. It's interesting. Do you know that? Do you know the song, It's Cruel to be Kind? So it's interesting because sometimes there's this idea. You want to be kind. Hashem wants to be kind. But if kindness means to let a child have whatever he wants, so he'll be eating candies all day. He'll be playing with knives and with fire, whatever it might be. And, and, and that's not kind. So Hashem said, you know what? I could create the world in an unlimited way with my great light. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't receive it in the right way. It wouldn't be beneficial for them. It needs to be Tiferet. So we'll get to Tiferet as well. Now we are bringing in Gavura, which is um, concealment, restriction where Hashem hides his wealth. And that's why we feel like we have our self-existence. So yes, Hashem is here around us, but he is able to be here in such a way that is called Tzimtzum, that is here, but we don't see it. And that's not like the sun. That is how the parable is very, very different to what we are saying over here. The parable with the sun, the sun, if he's here, you're going to feel him. If he's not here, you're not going to feel him. The sun cannot really hide itself. The sun, yes, it does have the ozone, which has that some kind of concealment. Absolutely. But then the rays are the only one, the light is only the only thing that's here. Here we are saying that the sun itself is here, which means Hashem himself is here, but he is able to make it uh, uh, such a sun that's not going to burn us. Well, that's the idea of revelation. So re revelation is... is, is oh, also, yeah. Right. It's not possible. Um, so uh, revealed, right? Again, everything is here, but what is revealed, what we could see, what we accept, what we feel, is only a, a small amount. And by the way, we started off with the idea that in the future the sun will be totally revealed, and that's the way that the rishayim, the evil people, will be punished. What are we doing gradually? Is that we are revealing Hashem's light more and more and more. We are, in, we are bringing the sun closer and closer and closer, but we are doing it in a way that does not cause us to evaporate and to burn, but we are getting used to the, the heat. It's like you go to the mikveh here in Shari Fesed, so there's uh, four different mikvehs. You get the cold one, you get the regular one, you get the hot one, and you get the, the really hot one. So if you're going to jump straight into the boiling hot mikveh, and by the way, there are even mikvehs that are much more than that. You got like six different levels and a whole spiel. And um, um, so if you're going to jump straight into the hottest uh, 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 tub, it's, you're not going to definitely not enjoy it. It, might, it will probably harm you, it will hurt you. Well, we, and that's why Hashem conceals the heat. But what we are doing is gradually through the mitzvahs that bring light to the world, we are growing the heat and the light of Hashem until when Mashiach will come. The idea of Mashiach coming is that Hashem's light will shine. We will be light in the sun itself. But we won't evaporate because we will build a shield that will be protected. And that is each mitzvah that we do, we bring in light. That's
Yishakach. So we learned about Chesed, we learned about Gevura, we learned about these two ways that Hashem creates the world, and we finally answered the question, so how do we exist here? Hashem is here? Yes, we have to say that He's here, that's not a question. So how do we exist? We exist because He's hiding in a certain way, this is Tzimtzum. He's here, but we don't feel it. Yishakach.